So let's talk next about the tests. Which kinds of tests should we look at running? Let's make a little room here. So you see the bottom of this. Um, I've listed some of the some of the most important tests that you can have done that are going to help you understand and assess your nutritional status. And one of them, you see this top one here, says lymphocyte proliferation, okay, to measure your vitamins and minerals. This is the most accurate way to assess long-term nutrition. Long-term. Why? What, what's the problem with serum? So a lot of doctors will use serum testing. And why is serum testing not a great idea? Serum testing is a reflection, in most cases, of your last meal. So for example, let's say you had a steak for dinner last night. You go in tomorrow to see your doctor. They run your vitamin B12 levels. Your B12 levels look normal because you just ate a bunch of B12 and it's hitting your bloodstream today. It's your last meal. It doesn't reflect long term. And when it comes to nutrition, it's kind of like blood sugar. Those of you who've ever gone to the doctor, maybe you've got a blood sugar issue and they measure your blood sugar. They don't look and they don't measure, they don't measure your glucose and call you a diabetic if it's high. They measure your glucose and if it's high, they'll monitor it several times to see if it's high consistently over time. But what they'll really do is they'll run this test called a hemoglobin A1C. And why do they rely on this test instead of this serum test? Because a hemoglobin A1C is a three to four month average of your blood sugar. Whereas glucose represents your last meal. And even though they're having you take it when you're fasted, it's still a representation of your last meal or last stress point. Remember, you go to, a lot of people go to the doctor, they're stressed out because they're in the doctor's office. Stress causes the, the, um, the disruption of blood sugar through, through catecholamines and other, and other neurotransmitters and, and, and hormones like cortisol. So when your cortisol levels go up because you're stressed because you're in the doctor's office, your glucose goes up even if you haven't eaten. And that, for a lot of people, gives a false reading. So we don't like serum tests because they can be manipulated by stress and other hormone or variable factors. Where This is why we like these long-term tests. This lymphocyte proliferation for nutrition gives us an average of six months. And the reason why we know it gives us an average of six months is because this cell type, it's called a lymphocyte, it's a white blood cell, and it lives and dies in about a six month span. So it has an average life cycle of six months. So we know when we can measure internally inside that cell, we're getting a long term storage of where your nutrition is. So it's more of a reflection of the long-term status and less of a reflection of your last meal, which can be deceiving and misleading. So we like this. This is a really good way to measure. Now, some doctors will look at you like you've got, you know, horns coming out of your head if you say, I want to run a lymphocyte proliferation test. Um, if, if they're doing that, first of all, find you a doctor who's an expert in nutrition and, you know, and let somebody who's an expert run the test for you. Because again, you don't, Here's the thing, you wouldn't go, if you had cancer, uh, you would go to an oncologist, you wouldn't go to an OB-GYN necessarily, right? You go to the doctor that's got the most expertise in that area that you're looking to get evaluated, and I wouldn't look, I wouldn't look at it any differently with nutrition. Most doctors, I mean, in the whole world, how many doctors are actually board certified, excuse me, board certified in clinical nutrition? Um, there's less than 500 in the entire world. It's not, a, it's not a high appeal career field for many doctors to go into. Um, and the others are, are, you know, are, are, they're just, they're looked at with a higher level of esteem, which in my opinion is the wrong way to look at it because nutrition should be held at the highest level of esteem. But there aren't many board certified clinical nutrition uh, based doctors to choose from, but you should look for one. You should try to find, and at the very least, if you can't find a doctor with DACBN behind their name, because that's what that stands for, Diplomate with the American Clinical Board of Nutrition, you should look for a doctor who's gone on after medical school or after, you know, whether it's a naturopathic doctor, a chiropractor, whether it's a, um, whether it's a, um, you know, a, an osteopathic doctor, somebody who's gone on to do advanced training and education and nutrition to a great degree, right? Somebody who's got an expertise in it, because if you allow somebody without an expertise to run a bunch of tests on you, then where you'll run into a problem is interpretation. They'll look at it and they know, they won't know what to tell you. They won't know uh, they won't know how much B12 is enough to correct a deficiency or how much vitamin D is enough to get your level up, right? They, they won't have those kinds of answers. And then you'll just be left on your own with a bunch of lab tests trying to interpret them 
And, and again, that's a bad place to be in. So you want to look for somebody, if you're going to run these tests, look for somebody who's an expert in running these tests so you can get a solid answer. Now, again, so lymphocyte proliferation helps you measure vitamins and minerals for that long-term six months. Now, some people will also, some doctors will use what's called RBC testing. RBC stands for red blood cells. So just like you can look at blood sugar averages in red blood cells, that's what a hemoglobin A1C test is, you can look at nutrients in red blood cells as well. And in some ways, this is, this is definitely more accurate than serum, but nothing's more accurate than lymphocyte proliferation. Okay, so again, I'm just trying to give you another option. Now, an iron panel with ferritin should always be measured. Um, you'll, see, you'll see down here where it says complete blood count. This is the test that measures your red blood cells, your white blood cells. It measures the size and the shape and the color of your red blood cells. It measures your hemoglobin and your hematocrit, things to help you understand whether you have anemia. Remember what I said earlier is a lot of people have iron deficiency but don't have anemia. This test helps you understand whether you have anemia. This test helps understand whether or not you have a problem with iron. So an iron panel with ferritin, remember iron is circulating iron and this ferritin is stored iron. It's iron that's stored in your liver by your liver, okay? So important to ask for that test as well if you're trying to assess your iron. Remember iron, one of the top five deficiencies for those with gluten sensitivity. So it's important to analyze whether or not iron is an issue. 25 OHD, this is a vitamin D test, okay? And it's probably and arguably the most well-studied and most researched method to accurately assess vitamin D levels uh, in an individual. And so this is a simple blood test. You know, most doctors know how to order it. But again, in, in this one, I'll even give you a little range here. So most labs will say between 20 and 100 um, is, is normal. I would say if you're, if you're gluten sensitive and you're looking to recover, you want to get your level between 70 and 100. Like you want to keep it up at that level while you're trying to recover and heal and repair. Another test, I mentioned this earlier, homocysteine. I said I showed you a diagram earlier that said with elevations in homocysteine, uh, it's very common in people with gluten issues because of B vitamin deficiencies. And homocysteine is a, is a marker, an indirect marker that, that tells us a little bit about B, B vitamins. And so it's a, again, indirect, meaning not direct, but it can tell you a little bit about B12, about folate, and about B6, and about B2, because these nutrients actually help keep homocysteine in a normal range. And so if you're low in these nutrients, it's oftentimes an indicator that you could be deficient in some of these B vitamins. Um, and then another test is plasma amino acid testing. So this is really common, as I mentioned on that first slide and in this study that came out of Mayo, is that, is that protein, serum protein, was found to be low in almost 20% of individuals with confirmed celiac diagnosis. And so they're either they're not eating enough protein or they're not absorbing it adequately. But plasma amino acids, so understand that amino acids are the building blocks to protein, okay? And there are, you know, arguably 10 essential amino acids, meaning of the 22 or so different amino acids, 10 of them are essential, meaning you have to eat them so that you can make all of the other amino acids. And so this can actually be measured whether or not you're low uh, in specific amino acids. An example of an amino acid many of you have probably heard of is L-glutamine. L-glutamine is not an essential amino acid, but under certain conditions becomes essential. Because like, for example, if you just had surgery, you need more L-glutamine for healing and repair. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had somebody last week, we, we, she was going in for a surgery, we put her on L-glutamine because her, her uh, wound kept swelling and retaining water. And when we put her on L-glutamine, within a day, the water retention went away completely and the swelling went away. That's an example of how an, an amino acid can become essential under certain conditions. And so post-surgically is one of those conditions. But so is post-gluten trauma. So post-gluten-induced inflammatory damage can lead to a greater need for certain proteins or certain substrates of proteins or amino acids. And so this can be measured uh, to give you an accurate assessment of what you might be low in. Another one is high-sensitivity C-reactive protein. This test here, HSCRP, it's measuring inflammation, okay? And so... Sometimes what you can do, if this is elevated, it, this is not a direct marker saying, hey, you're deficient in a particular nutrient, although it can be. For example, sometimes HSCRP is elevated in people that don't have adequate vitamin C or people that don't have adequate omega-3 
fatty acids. So it can be somewhat be an indirect marker. It's a marker of inflammation, but it can be an indirect marker of nutritional status in some ways. And that's, again, just one other aspect of how your doctor can help you um, understand more about your nutrition. And then down here again, complete blood count. There are other elements on a complete blood count that can help us to understand B vitamins. So, you know, how much, how many white blood cells or red blood cells or platelets that you're producing? If your levels are low, that might indicate a B12 or a folate deficiency or B6 deficiency. Those B vitamins are necessary to stimulate bone marrow to produce blood cell elements. And so you, when you're measuring this, if they come back low, I've seen it where a lot of doctors will say, oh, it's just normal. They don't know what to tell you when it's low, so they just tell you it's normal to get you out of their office. Again, I'm, I'm putting words in a lot of doctors' mouths, and maybe I shouldn't be doing that, but um, it's, it's a common scenario I see. People tell me that on a regular basis. But this, again, can help us understand some elements about nutrition, as can a basic metabolic panel. There are certain aspects of a basic metabolic panel that also can tell us about minerals and mineral deficiency. For example, alkaline phosphatase, which is a marker for bone damage and liver damage, but low alk phos can sometimes be an indicator that zinc levels are too low. So that, again, that's just an example. We're not gonna go into an entire blood, uh, blood test interpretation on nutrition tonight, but I wanted to give you some core fundamental lab tests that if you asked your doctor for, would help in the proper assessment of your nutritional status overall so that if you needed to target supplement or change your diet to incorporate more of certain nutrients, you could dig yourself out of that trap, right? Again, that trap that never ends, that damaging trap that most people are stuck in if they don't understand nutrition or if their doctors don't understand nutrition. So to reiterate, this is the number one most important thing I could teach you. And if you do anything after walking away from tonight's show, it's to understand this. If you're gluten sensitive, if you have a diagnosis of celiac disease and you're not having your nutritional status measured twice a year, is what I recommend, then take that home as the message. Get with your doctor, ask them twice a year to help you assess this. Remember what I told you? Lymphocyte proliferation gives you an average of the last six months. Okay, so if you have that type of testing done around the six month mark, that's twice a year. And that allows you to make adjustments and changes to your diet and to your nutritional supplementation because the ultimate prevention is not taking drugs to reduce risk factors. The ultimate prevention is giving your body what it needs before your body breaks down because it lacks something to such a great degree it can no longer function and heal you, right? So that's number one top priority is assess your nutrition to assess your overall health and prevention. Hey, don't forget to check out the rest of the series right here. Make sure you hit subscribe below. And as always, thanks for tuning in.